We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. G'day and welcome back to Space Junk Podcast. And today I'm crossing live to the fabulous Lauren Napier, who is a PhD student at Northumbria University. Lauren is also the program director for the Center for a Spacefaring Civilization. I just had to check that I got that right and I did, I think. Lauren, it is so nice to talk to you. How are you? I'm good, thank you for having me. I'm really enjoying that we can connect even though we're all staying at home. So it's nice to see that we can still have some, some fun um, between space buddies. <laughs> uh, so I'm good. I'm, uh, I'm here, like you said, in the UK studying a PhD on space law and policy. Um, my background is actually international relations. So my supervisor, Professor Chris Newman, has been very kind to let me actually study the governance of low Earth orbit from an international relations, international law, hybrid perspective, um, which you see a little bit, but not as often as I'd like it. So I will say that I'm more of a international relations specialist than international law, but I'm doing pretty pretty good on the law side as well with the privilege of those up here at Northumbria University. Um, I also used to be with SGAC, uh, a delegate for the Committee on the Peace and Use of Outer Space because I lived for eight years in Vienna. So it was right there outside my doorstep. I could go to all the different committee meetings. So I can say I've had some firsthand experience with that. And then yes, I'm working with Thomas Cheney um, at the Center for Space Brain Civilization, where we're working on policy issues related to different aspects of space. And right now I am heading up the Space and Sustainability Program, where we're talking about how we can maybe keep orbits and celestial bodies sustainable for the longer generational use. Well, that sounds like a phenomenal combination of expertise. And I think it's I a really so. interesting perspective that you bring because you've got that firsthand experience of attending COPUS on behalf of SGAC and, and watching these things play out in real time. You've also got the international relations theory side of things. And then now you're adding to it with the more strict space law angle. I'm really fascinated to know, what do you think are the key differences between an international relations view of what goes on in space and an international law view of what goes on in space? Well, that's actually really interesting because right now we're sort of seeing this again with the rise again of interest in security interest. And so <clears throat> if we just take, for example, my my expertise or growing expertise on low earth orbit and things like space debris and we're talking about mega constellations and all of these very nuanced technical things that need to be addressed. Um, on the law side, I know that we are always going back to the Outer Space Treaty and the other core treaties to discuss what was written and what we should follow. Um, however, now there's a new era of soft law, though I hate the term and we need to come up with a better, <laughs> a better way to describe soft law. Um, more of the, you know, flexible non-binding guidelines that I think are really making a difference for us. And so I see that we look at these words and the usage and the interpretation and think about how going forward we can, we can apply them to what we're doing. And that's, for me, the legal side. But from the international relations side, I'm actually more curious on why are they choosing to follow certain things? Why does the U.S. not follow the Moon Agreement, for example? Why are we now pushing sustainable development um, or we're pushing more national security issues? And as we're seeing, um, are we now making the decision that ASAT tests are going to be common? And then on the law side, does that mean it's a customary practice? So there's a lot of things that are kind of in parallel. It's just a matter of how you're, you're perceiving them. And I think on the legal side, they're looking at the words and why the words matter and what words need to, could be held up in court and be held up because of the action. Whereas on the IR side, we're looking more at why they're actually doing what they're doing and who's doing it and what does that mean, um, both historically and for the future. That's really interesting. I, 
I, uh, I used to study law myself and it was not for me. And I ran away very quickly from that. But one of the lawyers that I spoke to um, when I was trying to get my head around it and I was working at a law firm said, well, whenever I'm doing anything, I'm always thinking about the lawsuit 12 months down the track. And I'm always <laughs> thinking about how the words I write in this email will look in front of the judge. And I think that that's a really interesting way of looking at it legally. And I often think that that's kind of how space lawyers, when I speak to them, approach things. It's, well, here I have the words and here I have what's happened. But what I'm doing is I'm analyzing how this would work if I was in a courtroom arguing it in front of a judge. And the concept there is that if you argue it in front of the judge well enough, the judge then rules that your interpretation is correct. And there you are, you're vindicated. But the thing that always sticks for me is that that's not how things work in real life. Things are really messy in real life. And a country can, can and, and they do sometimes turn around and say, well, I don't like that ruling. But more to the point, most things don't actually end up in court in international mm -hmm. law, particularly space law. I mean, most things kind of just happen and there's this weird sort of mess of people trying to figure out what's going on and why it's happening that way. Um, and from that perspective, I think that bringing an international relations lens is really, really important. But I'm quite curious. I mean, when it comes to something like mega constellations, for example, in low Earth orbit, how would you look at that from this hybrid international law and international relations angle. So uh, Chris and I just actually wrote an article that will go into room about the main constellation astronomy issues. <laughs> so be on the lookout for that. But what I can say from the legal perspective, you know, we go, we went back to the treaty and we looked at is it something that everyone is allowed to do? And I know we'll touch on it later, but looking at Article 6 about the non-state actors and then the role that they play uh, in space, along with the fact that the state is then liable for them and so forth, as we know in the treaty that it's actually the states that have, or the launching state that has to be kind of on top of what's going on for the non-state actor. However, for me, from an IR perspective, I, I look at actors Actors can be different if we if we look at the state as a whole can be an actor, uh, a corporation can be an actor, an international organization can be an actor, but then at the same time, an actor could be President Trump or Elon Musk or someone individual. So we have to really be careful on that side as to what we mean by actor and, and which actors we're looking at. And so for many constellations, I can say we are now in the phase where commercial space is really important for space. I can't see a way forward without them, quite frankly, because I know that it's high risk and I know that it's very expensive. And I know that as more states come into play, they want to be part of the game and, and corporations and actually, you know, this, this new space era can really offer a lot for states. And so I see that they actually are going to hopefully be working together as we've seen in the past in the US, I mean, we got to the moon with the help of, of many different companies. So to me, I look at it that way as now there's actors that are helping other actors, but on the law side, some have a little more importance because of the treaty than others, if that makes sense. So there mm -hmm. still is a fine line between what a company should or shouldn't do under the information that we have from, from law, However, that then goes down to national regulation. If, if a state has good national regulation and has a good structure for licensing and for making sure that they're checking all the boxes on safety, you know, they're looking at the space debris mitigation guidelines before they're building anything. I think operationally, we have a great future where we can have a lot of different players if they're playing responsibly. So I think on the IR side, we have to look more at the responsible actor mm. versus on the law side, the legality of what they should and shouldn't do. And it's kind of a, it's kind of almost similar, but there's just little nuanced differences because, you know, um, like I read the other day, a state could actually choose not to license a corporation just because they choose not to, even though they may have a sound argument for going to space. So at the end of the day, it's still the state that's kind of making these decisions because of what they are bound to by the treaty. Well, I think on that note, we ought to actually read the treaty 
Mm -hmm. um, even though this is always a very dangerous thing to do, to actually read the law. I, I avoid it at all costs. So I am going to, with my very handy bookmark, um, <laughs> I'm going to read the text of Article 6, and then I'm going to basically throw it at you and say, what do you think of that? Um, okay. So prepare yourself for that. Okay. Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty says, States parties to the treaty shall bear international responsibility for national activities in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. Whether such activities are carried on by governmental agencies or by non-governmental entities, and for assuring that national activities are carried out in conformity with the provisions set forth in the present treaty. The activities of non-governmental entities in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall require authorization and continuing supervision by the appropriate state party to the treaty. When activities are carried out in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, by an international organization, responsibility for compliance with this treaty shall be borne by both the international organization and by the state's parties to the treaty participating in such organization. Lauren, what does it mean? Well, first I like to go back and say that the treaty was written in a Cold War era and the politics were slightly different than they are today. Um, they, you have the then USSR, now Russia, working with the United States to come up with something that would allow them to utilize and explore space in a peaceful way without turning it into a space war and keeping um, detente. You know, so I think that I always have to keep that in mind. And that maybe that's me as an IR scholar, keeping in mind when it was written and why it was written and who the main actors were. Actually, the UK was in there as well as a mediary, if you'd like to say, kind of a few different states were part of that discussion, making sure that, that different voices could be heard as they built it. So at the time, um, they were really thinking more just on civil, military, state-based activity. However, I think this is a very forward-thinking article because they then argue that if there were to be non-state actors, what should that look like and how should they make sure that they also are doing something that will not cause war and keep space a safe, peaceful place for exploration and use. Mm. So I think here we're seeing that they've decided that it's fine to have non-state actors in space but they kind of need to play by the rules of the states and the states party um, to the treaty of the treaty says. So I see that here, that this is actually perhaps the article for the future, because as we're moving forward, and I hate the term new space, because I think that has already happened. We already have enough commercial actors in space that now this is the new, the new way. Um, and it's actually quite normal now. So it's not new, new, <laughs> but, I do think that it helps that there is an article specifically catering to the non-state actor. They have to understand that they will be held under the state that they are launching from or the state where they are, you know, connected, from whom they're connected to. And on top of that, then they have this understanding that if something happens in space, it, say a company from the U.S., then the U.S. is going to be held to that treaty. So there has to be a good relationship at the level of the, the actor and um, the non-state actor and the state actor mm. um, that's kind of bound, binding them together in the treaty. And so I think there's a lot that could be unpacked from this. And I think there's a lot that could be discussed in the future about what this means, because a lot of people argue, oh, they didn't talk about commercial space. They didn't talk about non-state actors when they were the treaty. Well, Article 6 basically says, yes, they did. They just, at the time, maybe weren't thinking about it fully, but they knew that it was a possibility and something that needed to be discussed. And so I think this is where then we can maybe have a little bit of um, flexibility. There's not anything hard written in there about what they should or shouldn't do as a non-state actor. What they do know is that they need to play the game that they are under a launching state and that a state is under the treaty. And that I think is the important thing to remember. It's kind of a little nested activity. And I guess then also in order to enact that legality, there is a whole bunch of stuff that needs to happen. I, I often think that one of the quibbles that I have with interpreting 
these sorts of broad principle treaties like the Outer Space Treaty as hard law. And again, I don't like the term hard law and soft law, but as something that is um, all about precisely what the words say. One of the, well, I have a few problems with that. One is <laughs> that English is only one of the many, uh, one of the what five major um, official languages, five or six, I can't remember. Anyway, the point is that the English version is only, it, it, like it, it's correct and it's valid, but so is the French version. So is the Chinese version. So is the Russian version. And there are nuances in the language, in each language, that mean that sitting there and staring at a word and wondering about its Latin origins is only going to get you so far because it's only going to be so accurate. It's only going to be like one in five or one in six accurate. I really should know that. Anyway, that's a problem I'll solve after this. And the other thing... So I can tell you it's uh, actually English, Russian, Chinese, Spanish, French, Arabic. Six. It is six. Excellent. Um, well, this is good. I'm glad that you were along today to solve that for me. See, I can't even count to six. Anyway, six languages. So you've only got like a one in six chance of it being right. And it's some, co it's some combination of all of that. So that's one side of it. But I think the other thing that worries me is that if you read it just as the words that are written, as if it's tax legislation, and you're constantly looking for the loopholes, so that you're technically lawful, it, it, that is not the right way to read a broad principle. Like just on the face of it, that doesn't work. And I think that what Article 6 says for me is, okay, the broad principle is that everyone's responsible for stuff that happens in space and you can't wriggle out of your responsibility. So you better make sure that you're all working together and you'll know what each other's doing because ultimately if push comes to shove, it's the nation that, gets the phone call. And I think that that as a principle is, as you say, perfectly relevant to new space or space 2.0 or 3.0 or whatever else we want to call it. <laughs> whatever it is that Elon Musk is doing right now is, I think this is perfectly relevant to that. But what it requires is for government to work very closely and in partnership with commercial space operations. And I don't know that we've got that happening as we should. What do you think? Well, the other thing is, so I hate always having to use the U.S. as the example, but okay, let's face it, they've got a long track record, and I think they've got a lot of um, of the system in place that it makes a good example. So I do know that you know we've got NASA, we've got the state, the the Department of Commerce, the Department of Defense, we've got NOAA, we've got NASA, they've got all these different bodies together working on space from different perspectives and. You know, we've got our national space policies. There are now new executive orders and policy directives that are being put into place on very specific topics, um, as we've just seen recently with the lunar resources. And I think that that is where the treaty is, in my view, not extinct. It's broad enough that then a national actor can really take responsibility and build their own national legislation in a way that works with the treaty, but also works for their, their actors within their country. The caveat is, then you lose that continuity because each state is going to approach it differently, perhaps. And some of them, like you said, are going to interpret it differently. I've already had colleagues discuss with me that the word security and sustainability in different languages mean slightly different things. And those are two huge terms <laughs> that need to kind of be discussed in space um, a little more concretely. But the problem is you're never going to get full consensus on what that exactly means, which is why there's not so many definitions in the treaty to begin with. They wanted a broad mm. approach. So I think that's where the national legislation and this bottom up view is really helping because then they can kind of tailor things a little more. And also they can keep in mind operational. The treaty is not such an operational text. So if you think about it in juxtaposition with the new long-term sustainability guidelines or the space debris mitigation guidelines, those have a little more operational weight to them where an actual engineer or company could read them and apply specific things to the building of a satellite or the mission that they're putting together, whereas mm. the treaty is a little more vague on that. So I think the bottom-up approach is actually helping as long as it is tied with 
the top-down approach of still discussing on the international level, still using the treaty, and still connecting the two together. Because you don't want to have each state doing its own thing without talking to the others. And that's where transparency and confidence building measures are really important. And I think that's something that is being discussed a bit more now. And so you're seeing even at, at Copulus, there is a bit of a, a mix between a legal discussion and a political discussion. And things like that are what's coming up. And it's because they are now trying to find out how to make this commercial space atmosphere um, s run smooth, not just within their own country, but globally. Lauren, allow me to be that guy on Twitter for a moment. You know the one, and there are many. <laughs> The, the person on Twitter who like loves Elon Musk and, and you know, doesn't, has never actually gone and read any international space law, but who somehow weighs in on your Twitter conversation, or, or it could be anywhere on the internet. Uh, indeed, in the comments of this video, I'm, I have no doubt that one will emerge at some point and says, oh, yeah, but Lauren, those non-binding guidelines, they're non-binding. What's the point? <laughs> So Drops it's, true. it's true they're voluntary and they're non-binding. However, I think that's what adds to the flexibility. This is where the IR hat comes back on. States like to have their sovereignty. They like to have their self-interest and they like to have their flexibility. They don't want to be tied down. And so they understood that the treaty needed to be written and it is and it still stands of course we also have registration convention and so and liability convention and so on so we've got a few of them in place um however now as we're starting to learn more about space from a science and technical and physical perspective uh, as well as starting to flex our muscles on what we can and can't do and how how things are working i see that Yes, there can be the argument that um, soft law is what you could do and not what you should do. However, maybe down the line, and again, these are still too fresh to have a real analysis of them, but down the line, we might see implementation because they chose to do it and they weren't told to do it. And they mm. could tailor it to how it would fit their situation. And so, as you can see from the space debris mitigation guidelines, it's a very positive example. It's a very positive example of how space agencies came together, decided to write the guidelines, they were taken to the UN, and then they were put into practice through the United Nations. And so, they, as entities, had the interest to do it apart from COPUS having a discussion on it, apart from being told that they have to do it. They made the decision to do it. And it's the same thing with the long-term sustainability guidelines. Though those were done in COPUS, they chose to come together and to pursue a furthering of how we can deal with space for future generations. So you see that they actually want to be proactive and they want to have certain strategies in place and certain rules in place. But I think that they feel more confident when it's something that they can choose to be a part of mm. rather than trying to, to build a new treaty. Another thing that makes this really great for us is that if you take those other Twitter people that say that we should be opening the treaty, redesigning it, throw this one out, make a new one, I don't think they understand that when you've got over a hundred different states that need consensus, that's not gonna happen overnight. It's not gonna happen in 10 years. It's gonna take much too long. And quite frankly, in this climate, science and technology will pass us by, and then we would have to start over again. So the beauty of these non-binding documents is that they can be done a little bit quicker. They can have a bit more flexibility. They can be amended quite easily. They can be utilized as needed. And then new ones can come along again at a faster pace to keep up with that science and that technology. Mm -hmm. And again, as I mentioned before, it also can be a little more operational. And um, on top of that, you've got now something like the Space Safety Coalition putting out some standards. You've got different organizations like the, the ISO coming together with more operational standards and they're being used. I mean, the 25 year rule about how long a satellite should stay in orbit is pretty well established and that is a voluntary decision but it is being maintained in fact a lot of the companies 
um, I've read since the last IAC were mentioning that they might actually like to make it shorter to make it more competitive because mm. in parts of Leo, 25 years isn't even how long they would be able to stay in orbit anyway. So they're at least part of the discussion in this. They're interested. It's keeping them interested and it's making them think about their actions. And I like the flexibility that we can, we can change with the times and still stay safe and sustainable. Lauren, I think that is a beautiful place to stop. Thank you so much for a wonderful conversation and like the clearest summary of some really messy stuff that I have heard in a very long time. Thank you for that. I look Thank you for having watching, me. Oh, of course, to anyone watching, I did not make that easy for poor Lauren. I was like, just explain everything to do with international <laughs> relations and space law now. So I, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I, I can say that the all of these guidelines that we talked about today, including the treaty, are on the UNUSA website for free. You can download them. So if anybody wants to actually read them or consider them more uh, deeply, I mean, everybody can learn from space law. It's great. That's true. And I've actually been putting up a series of me sitting and reading the entire text of the treaty along with the general assembly resolutions and the preambles of each treaty wow. <laughs> um, with a space background in a different space outfit per treaty with a cup <laughs> of tea on youtube so if you like hearing things read in a vaguely australian accent then you can go and uh, you don't even have to read it you can just put it on while you fold your washing or do whatever other tasks you need to do in a day do your workout i don't know um, I'm waiting for the like jazzy remix. So that is also now in existence, which nobody asked for, but now it Well, is. I definitely think you should do the guidelines as well. They're a bit longer, but that means that you can be multitasking and learn something interesting at the same time. <laughs> well, if that happens, you will be the very first person to be thanked <laughs> and to be sent a copy. Thank you so Thank much. You. I will put links to the treaties and the guidelines and a couple of resources that Lauren has identified as being useful in the description under this video. If you are listening to this in podcast form, do not fear. In the podcast description, you will find the exact same things. Um, and I hope that you enjoy them. Lauren, thank you. I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you, you as well. Hopefully we'll talk again soon. Bye. Bye.